Okay, Good. now we're ready to go. Super. Super. Okay, I would like to call the investment committee meeting to order and ask board secretary Mark Foley to call the roll, please. Thank you, Chairman Morissette. Vice Chair, Trustee Wilson. Here. here. Trustee Malone. Oh, uh, here. Trustee Malden. Here. Trustee Phelps. Here. Trustee Gray. Here. Trustee Sexton. Here. Trustee Leonard. Here. Trustee Humphrey. Here. Okay, uh, Pro Tem Starnes and Trustee Brooks uh, are also participating uh, in today's call. Um, also like to welcome Chancellor St. John uh, and from Fund Evaluation Group, Nolan Bean and Michael Aluiz. And finally, uh, welcome to all other UA system administrators. Uh, Chairman Morissette, you have a quorum. Thank you, Secretary Foley. Lynn Cole, would you please introduce any members of the press? Yes, thank you, Chairman Morissette. We did not receive any RSVPs for today's meeting, but we welcome any members of the media or the public who are viewing the live stream today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lynn. The committee meeting agenda was provided in advance of this meeting. Is there any objection to the agenda as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is adopted as presented. You were previously provided with a copy of the minutes of the February 3rd committee meeting. Is there any objection to approving the minutes as distributed? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Nolan Bean with Fund Evaluation Group will now discuss recommendations for the pooled endowment fund and liquidity and capital reserve pool. Nolan. Thank you, Trustee Morissette, and thank you to everyone joining this morning, uh, and appreciate you doing it via Zoom. I'll, I will be in London next week visiting with uh, some of your managers, so uh, appreciate this opportunity. I also want to thank you in advance for all the hard work reviewing the materials. Uh, as we discussed when we were last together in Birmingham, there, there were a, a lot of things on our minds and things that we wanted to accomplish, so this is going to be a busy agenda. Uh, if we can go one page ahead. Thank you. So I'll try to give you the takeaway on each of these and we'll hit, hit each in turn. So uh, first we're going to report out on uh, the final scorecard versus Nakubo. So as a reminder, Nakubo is the National Asso Association of College and University Business Officers. So this is your peer universe of some 800 odd universities across the country for fiscal year end June 30 of 21. Uh, overall good scorecard there. Uh, next, we're going to give a little market context of what's going on in, in the stock market and, and the framework for how we're thinking about your portfolio and how your money is invested that hopefully will, will help make sense of the recommendations, given there are a lot of moving pieces there. Most of it will be on public equity. We also do have one private equity recommendation for your consideration as we continue to build out that portfolio. And then we'll wrap up uh, and share some next steps. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and basically is, is a word format of what I just told you, uh, but I thought it'd be easier to hit it at that, that high level. So let's jump into the Nakubo Peer uh, review. Uh, one more page ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so here we're looking at asset allocation. And at the top, the bar charts show the pooled endowment fund versus a, a subset of that universe of the billion dollar plus uh, endowments across the country. And we're not trying to blindly mimic these, but we do want to understand how do we look similar or different versus peers and does that make sense? Is that right for the University of Alabama system? And we attempted to uh, highlight what we thought were the most relevant areas and differences in those gray dotted boxes. And, and those areas are, you have a little bit less in private equity and a little bit more in public equity. And that is intentional on our, on our part. Uh, we did late last year approve an increase in our target to private equity up to 28%. But as it stood as of June 30 of last year, we were at 20. So we would like to increase that. As you all know, back in 2014, that number was 5 or 6% in private equity. So we have made great strides to get up to 20. Uh, ultimately, as we sit here today, trying to get up to 28, but that is a, a, a couple year more journey before we get there. So in the interim, we're holding that in public equity. So we're, we're still owning businesses. We're still 
uh, investing in equity to try to drive total return, but doing that via the public markets rather, rather than the private markets. Uh, and at the bottom, I thought it was just interesting to see, you know, how did these change year over year? And, and the biggest changes in allocation, both for the pooled endowment fund as, as well as your peer group, was private equity increasing, as it was a banner year for private equity in performance, in addition to our increased commitments. And then hedge funds coming down as, um, you know, I think it's been a little bit more challenging for hedge, fund to deliver, hedge funds to deliver returns writ large. So uh, pretty similar to peers in that regard. Uh, on the next page, we'll hit performance, and, and the bottom is very busy, trying to give you the, the gory detail by asset class. The headline's up top. So the fiscal year return for pooled endowment fund ending June 30 was 37.2. The median for all university endowments was 30%, and that billion dollar plus was at 36 and a half. So amazing absolute year. I don't know that we'll ever have another year of 30% returns. I hope we do, uh, but it was just an amazing return um, for the pooled endowment fund on an absolute basis and feel good about uh, the, the results versus peers, uh, but we're never content. We always want to do better, and that's what's leading to some of the recommendations that we're going to hit later in the, in the meeting. So we'll, we'll keep moving and get into the, the market update. And, and again, know you all follow the markets, uh, but really trying to frame and lead into the recommendations. So the first slide is, a, is an eye chart just showing returns year-to-date in the markets, given there's been a lot uh, of volatility, uh, an invasion of Ukraine, the Fed's raising interest rates. So this is a couple days old. Uh, I just looked this morning. So equity markets, depending on what you're looking at, are down around 6% year-to-date. Typically, bonds are up in that in, in type of environment, but bonds are down as well. So about two-thirds of the way down, you can see uh, the aggregate bond index was down 5 when we uh, sent this out. That's now down closer to 6 So if you're invested just in stocks and bonds thus far uh, year to date, there's really nowhere to hide. Real assets have held up a bit better. And, and the privates uh, only mark quarterly. So for now, they're helping. We'll see where the, the 331 valuations come in. Um, wouldn't be surprised to see a flattish quarter, but it's that's pure speculation on my part. So uh, I guess the only thing I'd note here is, is we have had a large allocation to real assets with the view that that was a, a third leg to the stool, if you will, between just stocks and bonds that could do well in an inflationary environment. Uh, and that, that has been helpful thus far year to date. If you look at that uh, Alarian MLP index up 12%, we do have a dedicated manager in the portfolio investing in those midstream energy assets. And that's up closer to 20% as we sit here this morning. Next slide, we just want to talk a little bit about the, the stock market globally, how we're thinking about it, and again, try to frame the recommendations because there are a lot of moving pieces. So big picture, we have a 33% target to public equities in the pool, pooled endowment fund long term. We're a little overweight. We have closer to 45% in the LCRP uh, because we are staying purely in, in public markets in the LCRP and we don't have the, the private exposure. And our lens and how you're going to see us frame all of this is is our starting point, how we think about this, is we want to own stocks globally. And if we don't have a view of what's going to do well, we should just buy the global stock market because there's wonderful businesses that can be headquartered in different places. And this is just an attempt to share that. So we know everyone knows the world-class businesses in the S&P 500, like an Apple or a Microsoft. But there are companies like Nestle in Europe or Roche, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, in Taiwan, that are headquartered in different countries, even though they do business globally. So if we, if we invest on the, on the public side globally, we capture that broad universe. And the next slide puts some numbers on that, on what percentage of publicly traded stocks are in different regions. A uh, busy slide, but the kind of the middle section that gives you the takeaway. 60% of all businesses by size, by market cap, are, are headquartered in the US, call it 30% in round numbers in international developed markets, Europe and Japan. And, and a little over 10% are considered emerging. So China, Taiwan, India. So this is our starting point, and this is our benchmark that we're using for the portfolio. Uh, the next slide is, is a really busy, uh, a lot of words. Why we thought this was relevant was uh, what we were just talking about with uh, Russia invading Ukraine. Russia was a very, very small part, less than a half percent of the global stock market. Uh, that's now zero. And if you looked at uh, your portfolio, um, 
it was it was more or less in the same size, less than a half percent, and now zero as as managers either either sold positions or uh, anything that couldn't be sold when the market froze is currently marked at zero. So um, not looking to add Russia to the portfolio, but know it's timely. So wanted to make sure we covered that with the investment committee. Uh, just on the on the why global, it's been a bad idea to be blunt, the last decade as the U.S. has dominated. So on the next slide, tries to take a little bit longer lens. And what we're showing here are just rolling five-year returns of, of the U.S. stock market, international markets, and emerging markets. In the last decade, the U.S. has just trounced everything. Uh, we are of the view that markets cycle, and, and the next 10 years won't necessarily be like the last. So if we own a little bit of all of these markets, with most of it being in the U.S., we think that will deliver a more uh, consistent ride, a smoother return over time. Really wish we had more in the U.S. the last decade. Now's probably the wrong time to pick. We want to have a little bit of this in the portfolio at all times um, and, and um, smooth out that ride. Uh, the next slide just makes the point that because the U.S. has done better, it's a more expensive market. If the U.S. was trading at the same valuation as a company in some of these other countries where there may be some additional risks, we would favor the U.S. But today, these are just a price-to-earnings ratio. I think the market's pricing in some of that additional risk where it's a little bit of a fair fight. All right, last slide, just to again round out here and, and end where I began. We're ultimately trying to get about a third of the pool endowment fund in public equities, have a little bit more today. And then if you look at the pie chart on the left, that's the composition, which looks uh, remarkably similar to the index, because we're not trying to make top-down views. Uh, I don't think I'm smart enough to say is India or China or the U.S. or the U.K. going to be the best performing stock market over the next year. Let's own a little bit of that, and let's find world-class managers to buy the right businesses on our behalf and let that fundamental stock picking drive our returns is the punchline and the segue into the recommendations. So as I mentioned, if we can go to, yeah, two more slides ahead, there are a lot of moving pieces here. Thank you again for all of your hard work and diligence reviewing materials in advance. So on the pooled endowment side, there's going to be a recommendation here to terminate three managers, PIMCO RAE, Yoast, and DFA Emerging Markets. And then in addition of a new index fund, that, that global index, the All Country World, PCI or Children's Investment Fund, Poland Capital. Poland's an existing manager in LCRP. We would like to add that to the pooled endowment fund. And then adding Red Wheel Emerging Markets and a PIMCO US strategy, which is more of balancing out top-down risks. And I'll, I'll try to share why we think that makes sense. And then as I mentioned, one, one new private equity recommendation, a $15 million commitment to Sterling Group Partners Foundation Fund. LCRP, very similar. Um, we did have a small S&P 500 index exposure there, so you'll see that as one difference where also terminating that, so we have that same global uh, index fund that, that matches our benchmark and gives us that broad exposure. The rest of it looks the same, X private equity, again, where we're not doing privates in LCRP to retain that liquidity. I'll start on, on the private equity. So the next slide, again, you've, you've seen many times in the past. We continually update how much, how many dollars do we need to be committing. This number is growing uh, for the happy reason that the portfolio is getting bigger, so we need, do need to commit more dollars. So it's going to be somewhere on the order of 100 to 120 to 40 million dollars um, year over year. Uh, the next slide gives you the high level on the portfolio on performance and positioning. So again, that line graph in the bottom left shows that journey of, of an increase in, in privates. Um, from less than 5% uh, to where we are today. Uh, performance over the last five years, as we've built it up in the bottom right, we've annualized a 33% um, rate of return. I do think that will come down, but do believe there's still good return potential on a, on a go-forward basis. And then the top right, this is the, the strategy breakdown. So how much is in venture capital, earlier stage companies, uh, versus growth equity, which are a little bit further along in their journey, versus secondaries and buyouts, which is buying more mature existing businesses, typically founder-owned, um, kind of entrepreneur-led businesses that are mature, stable companies. That's become smaller, again, for the happy reason that venture's driven a lot of our returns, so it's gotten bigger. 
So Sterling, which is the manager we're going to talk about today, is in that buyout camp, which gives us a little bit more balance so we're not too heavily skewed towards venture, which has just grown through performance to be a bigger piece of the portfolio. So the next slide, I'll, I'll give you the overview of Sterling. There's a lot of words here, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to hit what I believe are the, the highlights. Sterling is a, is a firm you all may be familiar with that's been in business now for 40 years out of Houston, Texas. And by, you know, industrial manufacturing, pretty boring businesses making widgets, but you can, you can make really good returns investing in those. Typically the first institutional capital, investing in family-owned entrepreneur-led businesses. And they've, they've had wonderful success over the years and have grown larger and larger as a firm such that their last fund was over $2 billion. What they looked, when they looked at their history, however, they made the best returns when they're investing in smaller companies, when they had smaller fund sizes. So they wanted to create a new fund focused on that segment of the market that was right-sized for the opportunity. And they, they hired in a new partner, uh, Lucas Cutler, who we know, and had a track record at a prior firm to lead that initiative but have the support of their broader organization, whether that was legal, accounting, their operations team that tries to add value through improving the business, investor relations, all of that. So you have an established firm. You don't have to worry about building out the business and back office functions with a good brand. I think the Sterling name means something uh, in, in the sectors they play, uh, but out of a fund that can focus on the lower end of the market, which again has been our focus and I think uh, consistent with the investment committee's views. So. So you put all that together, we think it's a pretty interesting uh, comp, uh, value proposition, and, and we're pretty excited about this one. So our recommendation here, again, is $15 million. You can see the track record at the bottom of the page for the broader Sterling organization. As I mentioned, Lucas has a track record of, of investments he's made at prior firms that's actually even a little bit better than uh, Sterling as a broader organization. So that's the private equity commitment. Uh, moving into public equity, again, we'll, we'll, we'll try to zoom in and then ultimately hit the manager. So, gave you the big picture. Um, we're going to be long-term investors. I think that aligns with a, a university that defies the two certainties in life, death and taxes. This is the ultimate long-term pool of capital. We're not day traders, so we want to find managers that have that similar view. Um, we don't want to pay more than we have to. So, if we a lot of the, the fund structures, we've invested in them in lower management fees, but uh, the managers can make a little bit more money if they actually beat their benchmarks. And then the last two, I, I think, are critical and, and really the, the most specific to why, why we're doing what we're doing is this view that if we looked at our history, we've done a, a decent job of, of finding good managers that can add value. When we've tried to make top-down market calls, uh, we're, we're not as good at that. So we would like to eliminate that as best as we can of, of trying to time countries or should we be investing in value or growth stocks and build a balanced portfolio. So, so all of these recommendations are trying to balance out the portfolio so we're not making top-down views, bottom-up owning good businesses, finding good stock pickers uh, is what, how we want to add value. And, and I think the mix we have in front of you also diversifies it so that we don't have too many of our eggs in one basket of just one manager uh, driving whether we win or lose, we're trying to find several world-class managers with different styles that complement each other should deliver a more consistent return. So I covered I cover the Nakuba results. They were pretty good last year. Pri public equity wasn't that great, to be honest. We, we can do better, and, and this is our move to get this aligned where we feel we have uh, a much better portfolio with better, better athletes on the field, if you will, to drive future performance out of public equity. Uh, the next slide is a visual to try to paint a picture of what I told you. There was a lot of analytics and numbers that, that we're not going on this call to verify this, but this is the picture at the top. So showing the different managers, if you approve the recommendations and where they fit in, some are global, some are U.S. focused, and then within each bucket, if they're on the left-hand side, they're more value-oriented. If they're on the right, they're growthier. So again, balancing styles. And then within the U.S., have some managers doing buying larger cap businesses, some buying smaller cap. So this is, a, this is the visual of how these puzzle pieces fit together and complement each other to get that balance top-down. So whether we outperform or underperform our benchmark will be from that bottom-up stock selection from the managers we've hired and have on the field for us. Uh, the next slide is one more way to, to show that. So on the top left, 
is just how much would be active managers versus just the passive index. Most is active over time. Again, we think the markets had a great run. All you needed was an index the last 10 years. I don't think that's going to be the case going forward. So I think active management will be important. And we do like having a little bit of passive exposure because we get a lot of capital calls if there's money needed at, a, at the university, if there's a draw. Uh, it's nice to have an index fund where you can just pull some money in and out. So it gives us some liquidity to manage, manage cash flows. The other two things we're showing here is geographic in the top right and sector at the bottom relative to the index. What you'll see is we're kind of plus or minus 3%, and this will bounce around a little bit based upon where the manager, over time, based upon where the managers are finding value, but, but intentionally not trying to be too far off on any of these. Again, so finding good businesses and stock selection derives whether we win or lose, not us making top-down calls that we think we know which sector or country is going to be the best. Okay, let me hit each recommendation now. Uh, I know I'm droning on a little bit, but I'll, I'll wrap up with these and then happy to answer any questions. So first, uh, here's uh, just the summary of the terminations. And nothing wrong with these managers. It just didn't fit in well when we tried to accomplish what I mentioned of balance, uh, eliminating some of those top down. So eliminating Yoast, PIMCO RE, we're actually keeping the strategy but moving it to US, which would achieve the balance once we found the stock pickers we wanted. Balancing that out, that's more of a, a index-like exposure. Uh, DFA is just more quantitative. We're trying to find more bottom-up fundamental stock pickers. And then, again, the S&P 500 index is just a shift in index to mimic the benchmark we're using of that broad universe of investing globally. So the first manager I'll hit is on page, uh, the next page, 24, TCI, the Children's Investment Fund. Uh, this is a group we've known for a long time and run by Chris Hahn. If you look over there, uh, almost 20-year track record towards the bottom right. Uh, since inception, they've, they've returned uh, just shy of 18% annualized net of fees. Over the same time, the market's done eight. So have, have delivered pretty consistent outperformance, fairly concentrated where they're going to own 15 to 20 businesses and will engage with the board and management to, to try to drive value of what should the strategy of the, of the business be. So this is almost private equity-like, light, if you will. Chris on had a background in private equity where he wants to engage with management and, and ensure the business has the right strategy, not just looking at a Bl Bloomberg screen and, and typing in tickers. So I think it's a great manager, a little bit different style than, than we have in the portfolio with that more active engagement. Uh, so recommend it, recommending adding this to both pools and uh, a group that I'll see when I'm in London next week. Uh, the next slide, I'll do this a little quicker because this is a familiar group uh, to the committee with poll and focus growth. Have this in the LCRP, and they're buying high-quality businesses in the U.S. and quality growth for, for their style. They're looking for growth businesses, but they don't want to overpay. They want you know, a little bit of not light use of debt. They want earnings growth to drive stock performance. And over their history, they've, they've outperformed the market by about 4% annualized. So like what they're doing for us, like what they're, they're doing on LCRP, we'd like to add that in the pooled endowment fund to fit that piece of the puzzle, giving us exposure to quality growth businesses in the U.S. Nolan, isn't he uh, University of Alabama connected? The, the CEO, Stan Moss, is, a, is an Alabama grad as well. Yes, sir. Great. N known well. He's, he's um, I think, come back to campus and spoke spoken a few times. Uh, so uh, stands fantastic, and they, they stand on their merits here. I think just a great, great stock picker. Super. Yep. N next is Red Wheel. So within, within emerging markets, we have an existing value manager. This would give us some exposure to growth within emerging markets. So again, balancing out those styles. And one of the things that we like here, in addition to their track record, they've outperformed by about five percentage points annualized, over time is in emerging markets, these are incredibly volatile, as we're seeing play out in front of our eyes right now, where macro can dominate the micro. So they're still bottom-up stock pickers, but they work uh, with, a, with a group, Rice Hadley Gates, where there's folks like Condoleezza Rice and Bill Gates that are very attuned to what's going on geopolitically that they can tap into and talk to whenever they need insights uh, to ensure really risk management, that they, they're not cut off guards when you have these big gyrations in emerging markets. So you think that combination of macro as well as the bottom-up stock picking 
makes a ton of sense within emerging markets, and, and this is a good complement to our other manager. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, PIMCO RAE. So the, the goal here is just to get to exposure to value stocks within the U.S. in a low-cost way. This is what, what's known as a fundamental index, where they're going to own a little bit of all the value stocks in the U.S. They charge a very low fee. So think banks, you know, financials, insurance companies, um, resource-related companies. Just getting some of that exposure, it balances out what we have with someone like a Poland really well. And they're trying to add a little bit of value over time uh, over the index and do it in a low cost, very liquid, simple way. So those are the manager recommendations and, and a little bit on each of the managers. So 28 summarizes those uh, one more time. Again, I know it's a lot. Thank you very much uh, for all the work leading up to this. And with that, I will um, turn it back to you, Trustee Morissette, to see if there's questions uh, on any of the recommendations. Questions for Nolan? Okay, I'll start off with one question, Nolan. You mentioned uh, with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia that even though we had a very small uh, percentage of uh, Russian-connected investments, they were either sold or marked down to zero. You were talking about uh, our, our investments particularly, right? Yes, sir. And so did we sell everything or do we have some that we marked down to zero? And how much money was that just ballpark? Yep. So um, I was speaking to you specifically. We did not take any action to sell at our level. One of your managers uh, within emerging markets uh, had the exposure and they've, they've taken the action of selling a couple of positions and have a few that the stock market closed down where they can't sell that they've written down. So that, that write down at the total portfolio level, this is not going to be to the basis point, but call it, you know, 10, 10 to 20 basis points um, impact from that, that right. Well, pre-invasion, the market started selling down and then that last little bit of a write down, 10 to 20 basis points. So less than a quarter of a percent. Great. Thank you. Harris, it's Stan. It's Stan. Just one question. Um, when we, either join or terminate a new fund or advisor, is there typically any frictional cost or transactional cost beyond the loss or gain on the investments? Very minimal. So the, well, Northern Trust is the custodian of these assets, so they'll, they will buy and sell on your behalf. So it could, you know, it's, we're talking 10, 20, $50 types of, of transaction costs. So there is some frictional trading costs, but, but fairly minimal in, in the context of the portfolio. Thank you. Yeah, so we don't do this lightly. Again, it's trading is usually, usually better off doing nothing um, versus just trading all the time. So we don't take these actions lightly. Um, it just felt like we needed to, to reboot the public equity portfolio and, and it spent a lot of time on private equity. So there's a lot of little things we've been thinking about that just culminated where there's a lot of action here and there will be some transaction costs, but we think net of that, we, we believe we'll have a better portfolio on the, on the back end. This is Jim Wilson. Um, I'm very concerned about pricing of private equity. Uh, we have seen a mark, a, you know, mark to market, but mark to market is not really, that's not cash in the bank. I don't have, I don't, until I get a Fed wire number, I don't have anything on private equity. Um, I understand private equity usually lags the stack, stock market from six to nine months, but we're, we're pushing private equity pretty hard. And so is everybody else. And, but we have not seen private equity uh, experience high interest rates. Um, uh, the, the shock to the supply chain and now an international crisis. And I'm concerned that the value, remember the values that we have on our private equity is just pieces of paper. It's not firm. It's not like a stock with a stock price. It's a value that, that the private equity guys assume that it's worth. And, that, and that's just, the, that's just the, 
that's just what we're the role we're playing and that's just the market it is but i'm very concerned about liquidity of private equity and it moving forward what is y'all's position on that we share your concerns so if last year we actually did not commit the amount we targeted we were trying to commit a 100 or 120 i think we only got to 80 because we're just worried about the market it's frothy you're, you're spot on with everything you said i think where that risk is most pronounced right now is within venture capital. So if you look at what happened to smaller, fast-growing businesses that are publicly traded, they're off 40 or 50% from their highs. And a lot of the venture managers have not seen any real marks. So I would not be surprised at all if we see start to see some write-downs, in particular out of the venture capital side of the portfolio. Um, on the on the Traditional private equity or buyout side, rising interest rates are going to be a risk, in particular for those that are aggressive users of leverage. So we are very much focused on finding private equity funds that are more modest users of leverage, where rising interest rates will be less of a headwind. I'm not saying it won't be a headwind, but the businesses can survive. And um, looking for more opportunities in that buyout space where, in particular, in the lower end of the market, if you're buying companies that you know, do 50, 60, 70 million of revenue, it's less of a macro story. Those can continue to grow. Uh, they are US focused that we're investing in. And if you can find a good business that's carved out a nice little niche in a small segment, you can go from 50 million to 75 million or 100 million of revenue and um, increase profits. I think that's a reasonable place to have some capital. But listen, I, I think everything right now is still a little expensive, and, and the Federal Reserve's raising rates and reducing their balance sheet. So, uh, risk assets, I think, are going to have a, a headwind from those from those macro forces. So we need to be very careful in how much we deploy, and um, make sure we have the right partners that are are aware of that backdrop, not using too much leverage, so that they can live to fight another day. Nolan, it's Stan again. How concerned should we be that very few, if any, of our managers have ever managed investments in an inflationary environment? I, th I think we. it's a wonderful question, one that we think about. I, I've, I've been doing this for two decades, so I've, I've not real, really seen any real inflation. So I'm trying to be a student of history. Um, and I think there's a premium to be placed on folks that have actually experienced that. So if you look at Sterling, who we're investing in today, while, while Lucas Cutler, who's the, the gentleman they brought in to run this endeavor, he's mid to late 40s, hasn't really seen it. The founders of Sterling have, and, and he has those folks as a sounding board that have some of the battle scars. So um, unless you've experienced it, I don't think it's the same thing. I think you can, you can study history as much as you can. We are very cognizant and aware of that risk. Uh, and trying to factor that into our asset allocation, having real assets, having things that have free cash flow generation that aren't as um, sensitive to valuation declines. If you have a fast growing business with lots of revenue but no profits, those are, are getting whacked hard when interest rates go up and there's an inflationary environment. So hard assets, real businesses, durable cash flows, pricing power of the company, I think is a premium. And, and we're attempting to think about that when we're focused on asset allocation and manager selection. Harris, I've got a handful of kind of unrelated questions if now's a good time. Now's a good time. And, and Dana, the first one's probably more to you than to Nolan and pretty wonky, I guess. But when we look at these comparisons to um, Nakubo, which is using a June 30th uh, fiscal year, are we comparing our September 30th fiscal year in to the June 30th, or are you creating some kind of pro forma fiscal year of the returns that would match, you know, virtually all the other schools? Alabama's odd about being a September 30 fiscal year in. How are you doing that? 
So um, we our numbers are as of June 30 to be to be comparable and to remind you we have two audits of the investment pools. We have an audit in June as well as September because of our affiliated foundations that have those year ends. So okay. yeah, they're audited numbers and they've actually got the fair value um, markup for accounting purposes too. All right, good, thank you. And Nolan, with the um exposure in the foreign markets is that are you defining that as investments made on foreign stock exchanges or might they also be adrs in the on the new york stock exchange yeah, both <laughs> yeah foreignly listed as well as there's a, a fairly large subset of, of adrs that are uh, american depository receipts so companies that are headquartered overseas but but their stock is listed on the new york stock exchange we need judgment about what percentage is is in i, I view the the, uh, ex, the risk in those as being different but what rough percentage would be adrs on the new york stock exchange and what percentage would be in foreign stock markets this is a guess. I could get you the right number, but I would I would suspect it's maybe a quarter are are ADRs of that foreign exposure, and and three quarters would be listed directly. All right, and as I told you these were unrelated kinds of things, but on this London base, let me be sure I'm thinking about the right person. We for a number of years we were in a ready mix business. We had a substantial relationship with. Um, CSX Railroad, and I think it was this guy took a very adversarial position and tried to take over CSX in some form or fashion. Do you know if I'm thinking about the right person? The you are absolutely discussion. thinking about the right. You are absolutely thinking about the right person. So that's TCI and Chris Hahn, where they they own uh, two of the publicly traded railroads and wrote letters to the board recommending other board members and what they viewed as, as the right business strategy. So um, it, it is a what I would what we would call an activist strategy where they're going to have an active dialogue with the CEO and the board on board composition, compensation, and strategy for the business. Will that be a new type? And I mean, do we have any other relationships with investors who um, take that activist approach to changing board members and things if, if they're unsatisfied with the investment? This is going to be the most uh, focused on that type of, of investment where of his 15 stocks, you know, half of them, there's going to be some level of that activist approach. So this is going to be the most focused and first investment that's going to be meaningfully engaged with boards. Some of the other managers may from time to time, but it's the exception rather than the rule. So this is a little bit uh, of a different animal. Scott, any more questions? Guys, yeah, yeah. You, you may you may see Chris on a TCI in, in the Wall Street Journal from time to time. Uh, I would never expect him to see him on CNBC in a, in a shouting match like we've seen with some other activists. It's a little bit a little bit more behind the scenes on on how they're going to engage. Should we expect greater volatility from that sort of manager? Um, historically, that has not been the case because of the, the he's buying such large, stable businesses with free cash flow. During that transition, when they're trying to, if there is change in, in business strategy, any one company may uh, experience a little bit more volatility, but because he has a, a portfolio of positions, um, I'm just trying to look now. Yeah, I guess it has been slightly higher than the market. So he's been around, this is wonky, but the volatility has been around 20%. The market's been closer to 16. So it has been a little bit higher than the market, but not double. So your, your intuition was correct. Scott, any other questions? No, I'm just thinking about that from the standpoint of... Um, I mean, we're going to be a really small piece of what he's doing. I, I don't know that there's much reputational risk there, but it's what I was thinking about. Great. Well, thank you for mentioning it. Uh, all great questions. Anybody else? Questions or comments? 
Okay, well, Nolan, thank you very much. Thank you to Fund Evaluation Group, as well as Dana and Justin and our staff for uh, the outperformance. And let's please try to keep it going. Uh, prior to the opening of the floor for discussion, may I consider, uh, can I get a motion for these items? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you very much. After a motion second, Dr. Dana Keith, Senior Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, would you please present these items? Thank you, Chairman Morissette. Uh, Nolan has just presented recommendations for six new fund managers and termination of four existing managers. The resolutions before you are as follows. For the pooled endowment fund only, in public equity, a 2% position investment in the Poland Capital Focus Growth Fund, in private equity, a commitment of up to 15 million in Sterling Group Partners Foundation Fund. For the liquidity and capital reserve pool only and public equity, terminate contract with the Northern Trust S&P 500 Index Fund. And for both the pooled endowment fund and liquidity and capital reserve pool and public equity, terminate contract with Yost Focus Long Offshore Fund terminate contract with DFA Emerging Market Small Cap Fund, terminate contract with PIMCO RAE Global Fund, a 2% position investment in the PEF and a 3% position investment in the LCRP in the Children's Investment Fund, a 1.5% position investment in the PEF and a 2% position investment in the LCRP in the Red Wheel Global Emerging Equity Strategy, a 3.5% position investment in the PEF and a 4% investment in the LCRP in the Northern, a 4% position investment in the LCRP in the Northern Trust MSCI All Country World Investable Market Index. And the last one is a 2% position investment in the PEF and a 2.5% 2.5% position investment in the LCRP in the PMK. PIMCO RAE US Fund. Chairman Morset, I recommend approval. Thank you, Dr. Keith. Any questions or comments regarding these items? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Since there is no further discussion, will we please take a vote? All in favor or approve the resolution, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, opposed no, okay. And the motions, our resolutions are approved. If there is no other business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. And appreciate the good questions and, and uh, 